What's up, everyone? I guess I can move this down now. All right. Let's get this straight. Boom. Waiting for um, Natsu and both Natsu and Gene to show up so I could add them both at the same time because you have to do that when it's three people at once. So hopefully they both come in around the same time. We can both get them going. Should be a good one today. Should be a hell of a good one. Oh, look, I can like comments now. What's this? I can actually like people's comments. Ah. Um, Bryn's more into airbrush and stuff. I, I don't really know much about art. I kind of fucking suck. You like that shit, Guap? That's the orange base. The orange amps base that they did. It was cheap as fuck. See, yeah, I can like people's comments. How about that shit? They updated a few things. <laughs> so, Gene, when you get here, wave. And same with Francis. Yeah, I, I, bass was my first instrument that I started on, but I don't, I can't play it much anymore. I mean, I could play it, but just not like I used to. Guilty Pleasure guitar pedal. I like the um, electro harmonics organ ones. They sound like organ, then the synth ones. Those are pretty, pretty awesome. I want a surf bear, but I, I can't afford that. So, I'm not gonna have one. Well, we'll see. We'll see if Gene shows up. I hope he does. I hope he remembers. Uh, this week, there's Gene. Now we gotta wait for Not So. And then we can add them both in. Uh, what bands did you follow uh, in your most in my heyday? Uh, I played a lot with the Locust. Um, a lot of the, the early post-hardcore power violence bands. Um, lots of old style punk rock bands. Like 80s California punk rock bands. Not so you're late. Where are you? Let's see. Where is he? Not so. Can someone on Discord ping not so? Just in case he's. Oh, wait, I, sh I, I, I came on early. I forgot. That's why. Okay, never mind. Don't shade it, my boy. <laughs> and if you hear snuffling and snorting, Darby's in here with me, so that's all that is. Played with Locust, yeah, it's one of my very good, I mean, all of them are good friends of mine at one point. Um, still friends with Justin and um, Gabe. But yeah, a lot of our biggest shows were because of uh, the Locust dudes and 3-1-G. Yeah, Murray's back to normal. All right, here's not so, okay. Not so request to join. I think you have to send in a request to join for me to add you. There we go. Accept. Let me add accept. There's one. Let's see if we can get one. Three. three. There we go. Three. What's Man. up? What's up, Gene? What's up, guys? Good evening. Thanks for coming. Hell yeah. All right. Not so you 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 kicked the show off. I kicked the show off. You're the kickoff uh, guy. I'm the kickoff guy. Uh, well, you know, thank you for another Friday night of your time. Uh, we got, uh, besides the normal kick, we got uh, our buddy, uh, I guess we'll call him Mean Gene, on the screen. Uh, he, uh, him and I live in the same spot, pretty much. Uh, we kind of both uh, lived most of our adult lives in Mendo. We've kind of seen, like, all the various changes that have gone on. We both have a bunch of similar breeding interests in various aspects. And so we thought it would be cool to, uh, we're gonna do this a number of times, but we thought it would be cool to bring him on and talk a little bit about just uh, some, of the, some of the history stuff that went on in Mendo. Um, some of the changing of the times and some of the stuff that we saw from long ago and some stuff that he's interested in and we are and so on and so forth. So 
that's kind of where we're at. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, Gene, tell us, tell us about some of the stuff you saw growing up. Like what, what are your first memories of, of strain specifically? Oh, uh, I mean, like, I can tell you, like, originally, I remember hanging out, like, with my buddy Cy when we were little, and him, like, getting bud from his brother, and being like, oh, this is, this is, this is good, this is good, good pot, or a good weed, this is bud, you know, check it out, it's bud, and that yeah. was before I, he was probably, he was a year older than me, that was probably starting when we were, like, when I was probably, like, I don't know, eight years old or something. Mm -hmm. Cy was one of these dudes who smoked weed when he was like basic, basically like a toddler almost. Where I can remember like riding in the car and like standing on the back seat in a car, yeah. you know, allowed on the one sixty two on Covalo Road when I don't know, I couldn't have been older than like three or four years old. And he was like a year older and people were passing a joint around the car. And he's passing the joint for the adults and he's like hit taking a hit while he's passing it. And I remember just being like, like, Whoa. like it was just the weirdest, weirdest shit to me. But he's just one of these dudes. He's one of those dudes who like, you'll be at the, I remember being at reggae on the river when we were, I don't know, 20 or something. And a dude walk up selling acid and him just being like, dude, I'll eat a fucking sheet right now, dude. Just give me a sheet. I'll eat it just so you can watch somebody do it, dude. Like, <laughs> And so he was like, his brother was like a dude who had, um, like always the cool shit, like the guns and fireworks and fucking Z 28 and the fucking Sir Win Vega 12s in the house yeah. and, you know, other shit going on, you know? And like, uh, so that was like kind of, when I was little, that was kind of the exposure I remember of like early out and going places with him, like his cousin's houses and shit where, like shit you see in movies that you're like, you're like, damn, like people are, people are like living like this. Like the kids are straight feral. All the adults are just like straight partying and it's a free for all. And, um, but like, uh, he's always been one of my coolest friends as far as like, just like a super, super cool dude. That's always had my back and shit. And, uh, so like going back then, I can remember back then, like, um, as far as like, my peer group having weed but as far as just weed like weed was always kind of around it was just pot i remember being little in here and smelling people smoking weed and you like know that that pot smell like yeah. it's like some someone burning sage or something or usnia or whatever you don't really know but yeah. you smell it like oh they're smoking pot you know and then uh getting a little bit older um to the point when actually having like an interest in what was going on and seeing like a high times magazines and shit like that, or a little, a little bit before high times, probably a year before I saw the high times. Um, we like started, there was, I, I used to live up at, um, uh, what's area one Oh one now, which was originally check lodge or grape wine station. And, uh, I like, that was the first time I ever saw indoor was there's this big shed back still there. If you can one 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 you can see it's this big steel building, like just past the Creek. And I remember going in there and there was like the, the big parabolic thousand watt lights and seeing these big thin leaf plants that were like, to me, they were huge, but I was like eight and a half or nine. So they were probably like, you know six feet six foot tall plants or something they seemed huge and i remember him being like up on a little platform kind of and then the light being all the way near up by the roof and being a few feet apart and that was like my first time seeing shit like that and then right around then was when my mom was given that that um manila envelope that was that had seeds in it to grow indoor and it was like you got to have indoor seeds to grow indoor <laughs> we thought which turns out it's not true we didn't realize it until like the mid 90s when i tried growing a bunch of different other shit randomly which most of it didn't really work out to be that dank but at least you could you could do it it was yeah. weed and then all weed was weed it didn't matter if it was as killer as the northern lights but the northern lights was killer and that's what was in that envelope and uh my mom popped a few of those she got one plant that was a female she saved some of the other ones we ended up planting those years later when i lived in healdsburg down in sonoma county that was like 90 94 93 i want to say it was eighth grade for me so it had to be right around in that in that time period and um 
So that was, but that was like the first strain I remember having where it like had a name was Northern Lights. And then when I was a kid, I, I didn't know about it, but my mom and, and her boyfriend, like, uh, who's like my dad, George, they had stuff that they got that was, um, they got this stuff from a friend out in George's neighborhood that was the, that was uh, the Mazari. And they really liked it. And then, I was talking to George the other day and he said that about 70 in about 76, he was in San Francisco at the beach and these dudes had brought back a couple pounds of seeds from Afghanistan. And he oh, said wow. that was the first time he ever saw Afghani weed, which was interesting to me because I, I thought more like here, the other stories I know are more like 84, Humboldt, 78. Yeah, yeah. So he was like, no, it was 76. And that was the first stuff. And he goes, that was different than the Mazari that and that I got from Charlie Brown. And um, so he was telling me that and that was cool. Cause it's all this time. And I still, you still get new information, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was cool shit. And then uh, he was like, Oh, I wish I would have, I wish I would have hung on to some of those. Those were really killer. And the Mazari was a much bigger plant with like the big long buds. And yeah. Um, so, but that was, that was before my time, but that was like, you know, stuff that was, had I been aware of what was going on, that was stuff that was being grown, you know? Yeah. But yeah. But yeah. So then, so then really the Northern lights was like that first thing. And then I remember that being around and uh, the first clone I can remember besides that, which is probably around the same time, if not right at the same time, I remember Willow had just come out the movie Willow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that. 89 i think Something and like we that. went to this lady's house up in Leggett, and she had this weed that was purple which was really cool because to me like i'd always seen you know pot like still what i call pot like is like general weed it's not really not any distinction you're just talking about it's some pot it's some pot yeah. right she had some shit that was purple weed and the smell of that is still what i smell in the urkel and um like when i do all the breeding with the cherry pie i'll get these ones where like when i label my bag so that i remember what kind of plant it was the throw yeah. i'll put like leg it purple smell mm -hmm. on it to like so that i know like this is that one that's kind of like that and that used yeah. to pop out the stuff i had called the big red too um, and if you really grew a lot of deep chunk, the sweeter ones, you'll get some that are really more that style. And then I even got a lot of that smell when I smelled a flat that a dude had brought to the Emerald Cup that was, um, I think it was Green Source Gardens brought a flat of all these Afghanis that were recently imported. Uh -huh. And he had grown them to see what was in them. And some of them were good. Some of them were bad. Some of them smelled like cheesy they were all different smells, but a couple of them had that smell that I was like, that's like that, that leg at purple smell, you know? And it's yeah. easy because it's, it's an early smell, right? Like, you know what it smelled like the first time you smelled someone cook broccoli yeah. or the first time you smelled nail polish remover, or like, it's like a smell that really stuck with me. Um, so those are like the two oldest things. And that clone resurfaced when I was living out in this neighborhood west of here. Um, and it was uh, a lady who I was staying with and her neighbor, who's a guy who what I call perp came from, which is the purple stemmed stuff that wound yeah, up being yeah. real. And uh, they both were growing it. And I saw it and I was like, Oh, this is that shit. And, and, and it turned out it did come from the same lady. And um, you know, for me, that was a really long time apart, but for those adults, it was just a little while right now, you know how it is four or five years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. There was that, so there was those and then um you know around back in those days i didn't see a whole lot of different stuff i remember seeing like some some brickweed that was supposed to be um that was supposed to be thai and i don't know if what it was but it was very stringy very dark very compressed not a lot to it but people who smoked it would get the giggles really fucking bad and get higher than a kite it was way different than other like the other like bricky weed that i've seen or like when i bought like colombian brick for 20 for you know what you know 20 bucks a quarter pound or some shit or 100 
were found in Costa Rica. You like go through the whole thing and you get like a cup, you get a little bit of bud and the rest is all a bunch of garbage. And then yeah. you smoke it, you get high for 15 minutes, you fall asleep, you wake up with a headache. Like this wasn't like that. So I was like, hey, it could have been, maybe it was Thai weed. I don't know. Like someone had had put away or something. But that's, so that's like going up, you know, not a lot of different variety that I can really remember all the way until 93, 94. And in that era, old school smokers, remember, it was like somebody passed you a joint. And if you're like, if you're like a real weed head and you really know your shit, you're not like, is this the perps? Is this sour diesel? You're like, is it bud? And they're like, yeah, it's bud. And you're like, all right. And then yeah. you smoke bud, you know, if they're like, oh, it's shake. You're like, oh no, I don't want to smoke that. So back <laughs> then you didn't get attached to stuff very much. It was either like this shit's really killer or it's not that killer. And yeah. then uh, around, I guess it was around 94. I, I started hanging out. I had been living in Healdsburg for like a year and it sucked. I went to eighth, eighth grade down there. And uh, most people were square or the people who weren't square were skaters and they were pretty, pretty soon to turn into tweakers once they hit high school <laughs> later. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then like the Mexican dudes were really cool to me and the skaters were really cool to me, but the squares were kind of like, eh, this dude's like, you kind of tell it's like more of a stoner guy. Right. Yeah. So it was kind of weird going to a new school because it was real. There was more of that separation. I live in a real small town when I was going to school before that. And there's not enough kids for there to be any separation because you can't have a whole group of one thing or there's just three guys or whatever. Right. So um, basically I was down there and then I came back up north and some of my buddies had actually started growing in the bushes and shit. And they were they were like carrying buckets to go to to, to water and stuff like my my, my buddies uh, on on Instagram there uh, OG Foundation Farms and um, and uh, and uh, God damn what's what's his what's his thing it's uh, ancient ancient future pharmacy pharmacy yeah. And so, and then those guys and our other, our other friend, uh, Nick Rock was in that neighborhood and there was like a few, uh, my buddy, little Willie and, um, and there was like a few people who were out there and everybody was kind of into weed. And I went back there and started hanging out and they were all talking about the flavors and they had like, pull, they had like a harvest under their belt and they're talking about, Oh, we have this one. This is, Oh, these are the buds from over there. This is the one from over there. And they had named all the plants by the location. Like this is this one from the top of the pond or this was this chunky one or whatever, you know? And, and then like whoever the seeds were from. So there was like chunky marks from, that was like from the, from, from Mark who was chunky or the plant was chunky. And I never really <laughs> of it. And then there was tall marks, which came from the, the, the taller Mark, you know, the yes. other guy who was taller. And so they had all these different shit and they would be like, Oh, and all oh, these ones are tasty and those ones aren't. And I was like, damn, okay, shit. I didn't really know anything about that with weed, like flavors and exactly what they were. Mm -hmm. I just knew like I smoked to get high and I would smoke and they'd look at me and they'd be like, they'd be like, um, uh, you know, why do you make that face when you, when you, I get like the bitter weed face, right? Mm -hmm. They'd be like, why do you, you don't like the smoke? And I'd be like, nah, I mean, you know, you know, if you kind of cough out smoke and shit, it's all harsh and all that. Yeah. And so then I wound up having a little bit of the Northern lights and they smoked it and they're all, that's tasty. And I was like, oh, this is tasty. Okay, shit. I've just been like choking on it, you know, <laughs> you know kind of paying attention to how they were smoking, hitting it a little lighter taking it the deep inhale blowing out the smoke before you cough like the basic yeah. things you know you're more seasoned smoker but i was a kid you know and so um then that was when i started to then see all the variety and when we would go to school you know we'd smoke at lunch and people would bring the stuff from their parents and we find out what they had in bell springs what they had in spy rock what's uh, what what this girl's dad grew or what this girl's dad got from from you know bill graham presents people giving hooking them up weed because they were it was the people who were into that you know all the dead shit and um 
So then like, then I started to see more of the variety. And uh, in, in that time period around then, a little later was when I saw like the effects, which is what, you know, like, uh, uh, not, I think crossed the Mendo P with the, with the effects to make purple effects, which became really popular and is in some of the more popular things now. Um, stuff that we called garlic bud that I don't know that it was garlic bud as far as the strain, but it was really that crazy gnarly. Bud. It's like even more gnarly than deep chunk where the, the bracts grow like from the center of the bud all the way out. Like they're really long and narrow and caked with resin and oh, almost out inside with the purple stripes and the crazy funk. And um, around then too, was when I first saw like big blue, um, and then, you know, going into the later 90s, uh, we saw monkey balls, which people call deep chunk. And, um, you know, then right around then was when you start to get the clone wave. And that was when we got things like sweat, train wreck, Mr. Nice Guy, Green Queen. Did you ever see up Snurvel up there? I never saw Snurvel. I've heard of it, but we yeah. did never see it here. Uh, Snowbud. We did see um, what was in the same little time period. I mean, a little later was Blue Dream, Snowcap. Um, uh, there was one that was really popular in Humboldt called The Mist, which was supposedly like a Matanuska Mist thing or something. Oh, and yeah. people really loved it who loved it. Now people say it's mid -tea. It doesn't have much, but it was a really beautiful plant. It got these really nice buds that were kind of shaped like this and they were just chunky and covered in resin. And I crossed that with a big blue and I got, got a couple great plants out of that that were really nice, but it's because they kind of leaned to the blue side on flavor. It wasn't the most outstanding shit, but it was really popular and humble for people to crop that. That, Mr. Nice, Trainwreck, did Green you, uh, Queen, did kind of see, a little way. Did you see that... Uh... Did you used to see that blueberry skunk that uh, remember Sasso had that and like like guys like Tony Mendo and Craig and all those dudes that way back when were kind of working with him. Did you ever see any of that blueberry skunk that he ran? I'm not sure, man. We had one up here that my buddy called Super Skunk and it was not Super Skunk. He said it's blueberry northern lights okay. and it was very resinous. And to me, it smells almost like Penny Royal or like a hint of spearmint or something. It's in more in that realm of like, I don't want to say herby, but it's that kind of a thing where it's like that really cuts through, you know how peppermint is or penny royal. If you know what penny royal is, it's like the, it's like that really like sharp herbal funk. And uh, that one was cool. And I don't, I mean, I don't know if that would have been the same thing. I mean, he called it super skunk. He knew it was blueberry Northern light. So maybe that was kind of a similar thing. Kind of I don't know. Thing. I don't think, I don't think that blueberry skunk was related to anything that we call blueberry today, you know, uh, in terms of what became famous and associated yeah. with, you know, but, yeah. but it well, was kind of guy... like that. I would say like the late nineties there was kind of like, like he was saying, like you, maybe the late nineties, early two thousands was really when like the name strain game really began because like what he was saying, I remember stuff where most of the time weed was talked about like where it was from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like um, a lot of people called Sam, that's don't leave that up because that whole era when I talked about all those clones at the same time, everybody was growing Salmon Creek Big Butt. So that that was a popular one. What, what did that, what was the terps like on that one? To me, plain. Some people said it was very skunky and loud. Yeah. To me, it was. It tasted to me really soapy and good, and I thought it was really good weed. Yeah. And the plant was unreal. I watched um, those same buddies of mine. Um, uh, OG foundation and ancient future. I watched them put in yellow starts, like a foot and a half tall yeah. on like by ninth and, and average like five pounds off that shit. Jesus. You know, like, yeah. it was, it was huge. And that was in rows where they weren't even spaced. They could have just kept going and going, but they were just, you know, gave them whatever four feet of space and they were five, five pound mohawks of buds. You know, it wasn't <laughs> the dude who went missing up here that they called Rasta man. He used to grow these plants and my buddy worked for him. Um, 
who now is uh, Cowboy Buds, I believe. Cow, not Cowboy Buds, Cowboy Chronic. Uh, and he used to work for him. And so they had pictures on their fridge that were like photocopied pictures. And I remember looking and being like, why, what are, what's in this? Is there something in this picture I don't see? And they were like, yeah, it's weed. And I'm like, well, where's the weed? I only see the trees, you know? Yeah. And they were that's all weed. Like all that is, is weed. And also it's just a golden field with big old madrone trees growing in the middle of it. And that's the weed. And they were like, that's the weed. And I was like, Holy yeah. shit. What is this guy pull? And I'm sure he was pulling 15, 18, 22 pounds or something off of those because he, it was a strain. He was one of the first people who really had it and circulated it in salmon Creek. And, um, it was, yeah, it was wild, dude. But, uh, but that was a big one, but that, but that's all to say that at a certain point you didn't have to call a big bud. You could just say, Hey, do you have, do you, you know, do you have salmon Creek packs? Like, sure. you yeah. Salmon. Was, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think, I yeah. think that like, I mean, we used to get, and that the other thing that, I mean, maybe I'll like rewind a, a bit about a couple of things for people that don't live up here. Area 101 is Tim Blake, who ended up founding uh, Emerald Cup. That was his kind of like, you know, it was right on the highway, right on the 101. It was kind of like a gathering place. He threw like some mini festivals and parties there. He got in trouble with the county numerous times in the beginning. And uh, I don't know how many of the first, um, the first Emerald Cups were there. But it was kind of like a gathering place north of Laytonville, you know? And reggae on the river is like right across the border uh, from Mendo. And so it's like basically like as soon as you cross into Humboldt from Mendocino County, you're basically at uh, you're basically at the festival. And that's kind of where everyone would gather in uh, in the middle of summer and see a bunch of reggae. It was kind of like one of the few things that would like happen up there, you know. And yeah. when I was I'm a little older than than Gene, I came out to see the dead in the in the 90s. And then. Obviously, there's a connection between the Bay and Humboldt and Mendo. And so I got dragged up there. And I have in 90, I think it was 94, 95 was the first time I came to Mendo. Um, and I went to, uh, we went to Reggae on the River in Humboldt. And there's like two things that will stand out for me forever from being from the Midwest and coming from a police state. One was a guy walking up and down and selling buds. And the buds were like in a five gallon paint bucket with the colas sticking out the top and just like the ability for someone to like walk around openly and and show weed yeah which was so sketch where i came from was like crazy and then if people have never been there there's like uh um like the river runs through it right there and you can kind of like look up and there's like cliffs and where the cliffs are that's where the 101 is you know and so they'd have a bunch of at certain parts of it at least. And so they'd have a bunch of cops up there directing traffic and all that. And I had friends that were like in the know. So we got like, uh, you know, ri riverfront camping, which is kind of nice, right? Yeah. And I'm pulling tubes, you know, I'm pulling, a, I'm pulling a tube and I look up and there's a cop looking at me, right? Which you like, where I'm from is like an immediate bust. Yeah, yeah. And he just waved <laughs> and let me go on about my business. And when I was like 18 or something like that, 19, that was like the most shocking thing ever. I'm sure. That a cop and I could like look at each other from a distance and like he sees me doing drugs, essentially. Yeah. And he just waves and goes on about it instead of like radioing me in. And I was like ready to like throw the bong and run. Yeah. Because that was training. Yeah. And that was like kind of like my, that was one of my first inclinations that like living up here was kind of a total bubble. Yeah, it is, you know, was was really it was real bubble, you know, because it wasn't like it was accepted. People had a lot of miss people would come here and think that it was like le weed was legal and everybody liked it and everyone got along and this and that. And it was it was still really underground. It was still cat and mouse with the cops. Um, the era that that uh, Gene is talking about when his friends were starting to grow weed, nobody grew weed real like. I don't want to say nobody, but for the most part, you grew weed in the woods. You grew weed in the Manzanitas. You, you didn't grow weed like right out your back door. Um, you know, you put some distance, most people. Most people would try to put some distance between their house and where they had their patch because they didn't yeah. want to get raided, you know? Yeah. Uh, and fit, like he was saying, carrying buckets of water, figuring out how to run water from point A to point B, even to get your plants fed. Um, and, you know, back then, 
I, you know, I, I don't know what prices he was getting, but weed was like 4,500 or 5,000 or more a pound. So you got away with 20, 25 pounds of shade grown manzanita weed and you had a phenomenal year. Yeah. You yeah. know, the scale of everything was different in the sense that like you didn't have to grow like some enormous thing. Like, you know, you didn't have to grow hundreds of pounds to make a living. You know, yeah. if you got away with 20 or 30, you were set, you know, and then the trim scene and all that other stuff really wasn't that big of a deal. So everyone was kind of just learning. And like the, like, like train wreck, Salmon Creek, Big Bud, the effects, like he mentioned, there was some named things, but there was still a lot. I don't want to say until the purple craze when, when people started demanding uniform pounds, because like with outdoor, at least from my experience up here, like people would grow the same strains, but they would mix pounds and mix phenos. Yeah. Right. So you'd get three, four, five phenos in a pound a lot of the time, you know, and that was perfectly acceptable. Yeah. To do that. Like, so you'd have, you'd have weed from the, instead of the weed having a name, it would be like from whatever town or area, like, Oh, this is some white thorn. This is some Panther gap. This yeah. is from my buddies out on Spyrock, you know? And, you know, he mentioned that too. Spyrock and Spyrock and Bell Springs are pretty famous weed growing communities, mostly because they're mountainous and they're way out in the middle of fucking nowhere. And so they're remote, they're hard to get to. So cannabis really wasn't like, like, like permitted out here. It was more like a kind of a cat and mouse game. And there was a few enough people that you could get away with it. Um, you know, if you were careful, but yeah. everyone we know got camped sometimes. I mean, there used to be an old joke that you would like, you would plant three gardens and one was for you and one was the cops and one was for the thieves. <laughs> and you, and you hope that one of them came through in a way, you know, because you could go like same thing. You could, st you could go, you know, on, on, you know, harvest moon or whatever, when full moons during fall, you know, you could get people out there that could go with some contractor bags and they could steal 10 or 15 or 20 pounds. And back then that was, that was a ton of money. Yeah you could go and check on your crop and it's gone the whole thing is gone trauma you know yeah and at that point even when the when the clones started taking off and it was like everybody wanted to grow train wreck it wasn't because oh if i have train wreck i'm gonna get a higher price or people will want my weed faster you could sell any weed you had it just had to be dried right and it had to be mature and it had to be trimmed good you know yeah and it was only the only reason people were growing clones then was reliability. So if you would grow a train wreck, you knew you were going to get a good crop with a lot of weed and you liked how it, how it was to cut down and how it was to trim. And then, you know, it was reliable. Like, you know, you're going to get something good out of this. So you grow the clone and, and then also somebody tries this clone. It doesn't work well for them in their garden or the way they grow. And they try this other clone and it works really good for them. So they're like, okay, so then that's why people got stuck with the clones. The first clone that carried a premium in this area was Urkel and Urkel was the one that totally shot everything to shit as far as the, the um the diversity because before that somebody was like oh i like this clone and somebody was like oh i like that clone and urkel came and it was like well that's cool but this urkel you can sell right now for like 48 a pound half wet yeah. so you're selling 12 ounce pounds and you're like it might not be as good if you don't know how to grow it yet and you think it's done at seven weeks and it's really not at all but it didn't matter as long as you could get it to go at first, it didn't even really matter if it went purple, but it, after just a little couple runs worth of time going by, if you could get it to get dark, people would show up and they and you'd be like, it's still wet. And they'd be like, well, let me see it. And you'd be like, well, and they'd be like, no, just take that, put it in the bag. They're like, we'll take it down south and we'll dry it in our bedroom, dude. Yeah. And we don't care that it's not going to be a pound when it gets done because people were so hungry for it. And uh, that's super accurate because before Urkel, before the purple wave and probably oh three, oh four, oh five was kind of that was kind of that wave. He's right. Every good type of weed sold. If it was right grown away. decently well and it was dried, it was dried well and it was trimmed well, people would just there wasn't a name strain game. People weren't coming up here with like, OK, you, you need to buy X amount of peas and it could be these four strains. It was like, go get some good weed and bring it back. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah, the and it's seedless and it's trimmed and the, the day it's ready you know it's it's all a matter of if somebody of scheduling it had nothing to do with whether or not you could find a buyer or you have the right product or any of that stuff it was like there's weed okay it's gone and then everything would be you know back then it was there was only one big wave of harvest the outdoor not the depth and so it wasn't this constant thing of there always being weed. So it would be like there would be a bunch of weed, never a flood, and then it would be all drought for yeah. most of the year. And I remember being like, okay, it's August or July or September. And like like for Reggae on the River, we used to save our best, uh, you know, OG Foundation got me doing that because he'd be like, oh, this is my reggae stash. I'd be like, oh, shit, I, I better save a reggae stash, too. So you'd have, like, some buds that you came across through the year that were, like, the best weed. And you'd be like, oh, I'm going to take two grams of this and set it aside. Or I'm going to take five grams of this and set it aside. And then if you could show up at reggae on the river the first weekend in August and have a sack of weed like this, it was just, like, epic. Because people were like, fuck, how do you have that, you know? Yeah, stash. Some people would still have weed and people who were either had a, the, the good fortune to have a ton of weed or who like had certain um, either connections or lack of connections where they just wound up with weed in August, like you would have weed, but it was a big deal in the summer months to have weed back then. Yeah. And this you is, know? this is before cell phones too. It's before the yeah. internet or any kind of forums. So for a bunch yep. of people in humble, so in Southern humble and Mendo, like reggae on the river was not only like a, a, a it was two days back then but it wasn't just like a big weekend of fun you could actually meet someone where like they wanted weed right where like everyone you knew grew weed for the most part if you were in those little circles and so a lot of people made a bunch of connections to other parts of the state or wherever wherever you know because they would bump into people and like like he was just saying, like, you know, they'd smoke some weed and they'd be like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Can you get me more of this? Let me give yeah. you my number and you can call me after this event. And like, let me try to come up and get a few pounds. Let me try to get this. Let me try to get that. Because it was like there was so much demand. There was a little bit of indoor going on for sure, but not nothing in comparison to demand. And when outdoor came in, I wouldn't even say it was a flood. There was just more weed. Yeah, it would never and flood. It, it would never just would, like, and then it was unavailable. And that had, was like the two you can get it. And, if you had good weed for years and years, if you had good weed, you could probably sell it within three to five days of it hitting the bag without too much effort. And it didn't really matter what it was. Um, it mattered if it was nice or not, but it but the name game, the specifics of it, like I said, you could get you could sell somebody ten pounds, it was a mix of eight different phenos. Yep. And if it was good, it would go it would go fine. Yeah, you know, Trey, if it was good and it was pretty good, you were good. And if it was mature, and it was, and it was seedless, it had to be. It had to be. It, it had to have some. But it, but the names and the consistency, all the stuff they look for now, no, that that, that didn't really matter. Um, and so as a result of that, there was like a bunch of diversity because there was a lot of hill people that had their random strains that they'd grown for a long time, or their friends had given them. You know, not everybody bred, but uh, you know. Gene and I have talked about this before, kind of the, one of the most common ways people would breed because they grew from seed every year is every two or three or four years, they'd be like, oh, I should make some fresh seed. And they'd take all their sexed males that they vegged out in pots before they planted in their holes. And they'd put those sexed males like on some other part of the hill, away, downwind, you know, and then they'd have their females growing in their patch. And a lot of times they would go and collect mail, collect male pollen and then bring it back and like uh, brush it on their favorite females bottom branches from that year and mark them. And then, you know, when they harvested, you know, they'd get X amount of hundreds or, you know, whatever seeds. And that was their next two, three years worth of supply. Until they were like, oh, these are getting kind of old. I'm running a little low. I should do that again this year. Which if you do the math, you realize that those those things that are the modern weed, like the most modern weed, like it's the new, it's cookies or it's whatever it is. You go, yeah, it's probably only really, in a, in a lot of cases, was only a handful of generations displaced from origin. Yeah. You know, like 
a lot of Afghanis, they're not actually 30 generations after Afghanistan. A lot of them might only be three or four generations later because someone's like, oh, shit, my seed's seven years old. You're like, well, the shit showed up in 81. It showed up in 85. So then you go, well, when I was seeing it, it was 94, 95, 96. You're like, shit, somebody only made seed twice since it showed up from Afghanistan or three or four times. Like there wasn't even that much improvement, which – uh, was what I was uh, what I was going to say too about like all the the weed back then. You go, oh, it, it didn't have to be special. It was like it didn't have to be special. But if you saw the weed now that was in those bags that only had to be dried good and only had to be mature and seedless, you'd look at it and you go, oh, shit, what is this one? Yeah, what is yeah. that? It wasn't like the weed was undeveloped in in a, in a genetic sense or it was unrefined in a breeding sense. It was like no shit was bomb and and we actually what we have now that's our very best stuff is kind of the remnants of what was then kind of just normal weed you know like because a lot of this stuff that was uh in the hills in california was like really fucking good and everything that amsterdam got was just them going oh whoa they have crazy shit in oakland they have crazy shit in humble they have crazy shit in Santa Cruz and then all that stuff. They took it over there and then didn't even really have experience with it and, and tried to do some stuff and some people hit and some people missed. And then people wound up going, Oh, this modern weed, it had so high in THC. It's so heavy yielding. And you're like, no, the shit that I saw that was bred twice after Afghanistan was already like what people now look at and go, Oh, it's Holy shit. It's space weed. It's like, yeah, that was what, that was what, you know, like that was what came over. There's not genetics don't work in a way where traits just miraculously appear, although they do. It's very rare. And a lot of that really good shit, it, it was it was already it was already there in what we were seeing at Reggae on the River and somebody's sack from Santa Cruz that showed up to sell their pound or whatever, you know, like stuff was stuff was crazy, I think, probably when it showed up, you know. And I I would add to that that uh, I was smiling when he said that because one of the one of you know when you apply capitalism to all this stuff right a lot of the modern breeding is when you know you get some stuff and it's amazing and you're like okay well i spent a lot of time and a lot of effort and this is a result of me being really smart when we all know it's like it's a lot of accidents and you're already starting with good working material to begin with you know um a lot I, I, yeah i mean it's whole traits out of thin air you can like if you want way more resin there is ways to go okay i'm going to take a plant that gets way more trichomes per square centimeter and i'm going to take this one that gets huge heads but it doesn't have very many combine them and wind up with the best of both worlds and have something that has way more resin with way bigger heads and your numbers shoot way up but you still have to have those two traits have to be there. And separately, they were still pretty fucking good because you already had one with a whole shitload of resin, but the heads weren't huge. And you had one with huge fucking heads. So both of them were already pretty good fucking weed, right? So like, and in a lot of cases, when we find something that's like that, you're really just finding that plant that already had the combination in the first place and you you might think you made it through combination but really if you would have grown 200 girls of one side you'd go oh it was already in there and then i thought i made it and then you didn't fucking make it you just found it you know so it's like really with all that it's really like um you're really kind of more discovering than you are creating you're trying to find some good shit it's like you're not you're not making the gold you're just fucking digging through some shit to pull out some nuggets you know yeah that's for sure. And I think yeah. to, to some degree, that's why the 90s kind of remains like a lot of the backbone of modern breeding was because of all that diversity, because it was yeah. before the name game. But because, be, you know, like the last 10 years of breeding, not everyone, there's obviously outliers and people that do different stuff. But like in most modern breeding, it's like take all the most popular things I can find and blend them together. And hopefully I get a little version that people have some clout with, right? Where, you know, weed in the 90s was back could be vastly different because there wasn't pressure on it for it to be the same. It just had no, to be just good. good. It just had to be good. And Goodbye. the other thing is that it didn't even have to be pretty. It just had to be good. And by good, it's like if it got you high, huh? Your buyer smoked, dude. Yeah, your buyer smoked. I don't know smoked. if anybody knows this, but back in the day, people who bought weed, 
when they showed up, they smoked the shit. What? Can you imagine? What the fuck is that? that? You, you could not sell weed without them smoking a few joints with you and making sure it burned right, making sure it oh, wasn't yeah. harsh, making sure their customers weren't going to be pissed off. So yep. a lot of times you could go at, at some weed and they could be like, oh, this is suspect. I don't know about this weed. And you're like, well, let's roll some joints and hang out for a second. And then if it was good weed, they, I mean, in modern times, it's like name, look, does it have any larf? Does it have nose? What's your price point? Okay. Most yeah, modern, how many shitty, most, how many most shitty modern... dealers and like fucking shitty buyers have you guys had to hang out with for like two hours watching a movie just to do a transaction? That shit sucks. I mean, it depends. <laughs> you know, it's it's like it, it uh, you know, there was a whole industry of it up here. There was a lot of people that didn't like to do that. And so the people that were, even the people that were willing to go to the bay, right? Like yeah. I remember um you know going out spy rock and you could go talk to people up there um that like you know that they had indoor they had big underground indoors and stuff like that and you could get weed for like 36 which was dirt cheap and i used to tell them that i would like take it to the bay and i would get way more for it and they'd be like but you have to do that if you come to my driveway and we and i can be at my house and you give me this i'm happy yeah, and that's like it's 23, as a 22 year old, 23 year old kid, I was like, that's so dumb, you know, and I would go to the city and I make my margin and I party and I have a great time. And then I hit my 30s or 40s or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, man, that makes perfect sense. If you can just come to my door and be fair, and then go away. I'm cool. Because like, I got dinner to cook and I got some kids to take care of. And I don't want to go all the way down to the fucking bay. Yep. You know, and then the fair went away and it's still 50 and eight for most people, you know, yeah, it's still know. three prices when 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 pounds were about to hit basically six grand wholesale, and the it was like whoa eighths are worth fucking fifty and sixty dollars that's fucking crazy, but at least pounds are worth six grand to the farmer, yeah. and now you still pay now people are selling hundred dollar eighths, yeah, and people eh, I don't know you know this shit's really not worth any money you know. It's I mean, crazy. I, that's I have, that's I have, where the I have friends that joke with me right now that they can go into a dispensary and they can go buy a six hundred dollar ounce. That's or they could go buy a pound that's probably better for cheaper. Oh in, yeah, in this year's market. Yeah, I saw six hundred dollar an ounce weed, and it was fucking hilarious. Yeah, I, I was like. I mean, I understand maybe that there could be something that would be worth that if it was like really hard to grow and it fucking took 24 weeks and you've never tried anything like this but it's like it's just some bud that people used to sell for really cheap and it's not even as good of a version and it's like selling for 600 an ounce and you're like shit okay i mean the, the sad part is is that you would think with legalization typically it makes quality go up and price go down because you take the risk out of the equation you know, and there's there's a risk pricing in there. But so far with cannabis, the way we've structured California, it's kind of done the opposite. Weed in general yeah. is way worse than the 215 era. And it's definitely more expensive. Yeah, it'd be different if you were producing a molecule, right? Like yeah. you're producing a molecule. So like at scale, it doesn't really matter. You get rid of all barriers and obstacles and shit. And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, dude, we're producing this molecule like fucking crazy and it's it's not illegal anymore so yeah we drop the price to producing it and then but with weed it's like weed doesn't scale very well i mean we 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 so hard to scale that even when you go from seeing somebody who grows like like the best weed that i've ever seen almost every time comes from people who have like less than like a dozen lights if they're oh, yeah. growing indoor I, I and, and and yeah we, and one light is we used to have a we used to have a bunch of friends mutual friends that would you know they would work for older cats and they would run these 50 and 100 lighters right but they would come get their head stash off me because i had a 10 lighter and we used to joke that like you just couldn't get off that 100 light you couldn't get as good a weed you couldn't give it as much attention you couldn't whatever it was it was just like the little minor and that's kind of what happened is like People used to be able to make a really good living off 20, 30, 40, 100, a couple hundred pounds. And then you could treat that stuff right. You could dry it right. You could cure it right. You, you weren't overwhelmed. You could have just a few people helping you. And you could do the little things that kept it nice. 
And now they're yeah. like, how do I grow these 10 licenses I have? And I've got 2000 pounds coming down and costs are through the roof and I have to do OSHA and all this other shit. And what suffers is the wheat. Usually, You know, they start looking around at like how, what ways they can cut corners. And you know, it's, it's, they're not evil necessarily by any means. They're just trying to survive because shit's all rough and, yeah. or, or they just don't, they've grown a hundred or 200 pounds their whole career and that's been happy for them. And then they get asked to grow 2000 pounds and they just don't know how to scale up, you yeah. know, what, because their system that they had for them when it was smaller worked amazing, but their system didn't scale. So you try to scale yeah, it like, up it's like and cooking, it's not dude. scaling. You, you like, oh, I'm just going to double the recipe. That doesn't really work like that. You can't just double recipes, you know, you like you, sometimes you have to do it in batches. So if you can have somebody and say, okay, you're going to do, you're going to do like this many runs and maybe you're going to get more runs in or something, then people can keep it exactly the same. And then everybody has a ceiling. So some people can scale a lot better than others because of the, the way that they do things. Like as simple as I grow, I probably could have scaled pretty well because I don't do anything very special. And that's part of why I'm able to get weed that I really like because I just kind of let it do its thing. So it's mostly the soil. And then I really try to make sure to really like pay a lot of attention to harvesting and, and, and drying it. And uh, so like it's it's doable, but it's still I could still never do enough to be a big brand. You know, it's, I just and couldn't do it. Let's 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 be clear, too. Right. So, um, I mean, I came out here when I was in my early 20s, so I didn't grow up here like he did. But my experience is most weed growers back then were back to the landers, hippies, uh, people that decided to grow weed because logging ended and they needed a, a, a way to, to support their family, you know. Um, these aren't people that are like amazing at logistics, you know, these aren't like, like sergeants that are like, okay, you three do this and this is the efficient way to do that and this and that and everything else. They just figured out some kind of way that worked for them. It's at a small or medium scale. And then you try to like commercialize that. And all of a sudden their experience is only so good at that part because now it becomes logistics. Now it becomes like, you know, like now you're a conductor. Now you're trying to like move the orchestra around and like, you're used to kind of just winging it, you know? Yeah, and even when stuff becomes really super competitive in that kind of a uh, that kind of a thing, a lot of the people, it's like back when weed was rare, if you got weed and it didn't suck and it was good genetics, you were like, wow, this is really good weed. But then when things get more and more competitive, a lot of the people too who you're like, oh, they have killer weed. And like, it's, it's like, you're, you're like, well, but is it like, is it really that killer when it has to go up against people who are so knowledgeable and are going, okay, well, you know, this, you got to have this particular watering schedule and this dry back and all these different, like very specific parameters. And then it's like, it's like, yeah, their weed was really good, but it's not, it's still not competitive. And I'm not saying that's everybody, but that's a whole section of people too, where all of a sudden now when there's a huge flood, you're like, well, this weed is just not like, there's always been people who, who would, would be like, oh dude, I have this weed. And I, I'd look at it and I'd be like, oh cool. It's, it's nice, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, it's not competitive though, you know? And it's something that I can't, I like, can't bring myself to tell people that I just am like, yeah, it's, it's good, you know, but like you, you, you kind of, you just kind of look at the reality and you go, fuck, have you seen what people are doing? Like people oh, shit I, is crazy. I feel and, that it was, and we, some of us have always been able to do it. Like, like I was saying, like people, I know ladies who had one light or two lights and every time they would have weed, you just be like, holy shit. And to this day, people doing all the most scientific tricks, they can't, they can't do any better than these ladies with their two lighters or their four lighters or their one lighter. It's still the best weed ever. But and, and that was never everybody. And there was a point when if you had weed, you were like, yeah. My, and this is the funny thing, like with, with especially with old school growers and growers in general, everybody always thinks their weed is the best. Like I've never met 
I've only met probably a couple people who can look at weed objectively and go, oh, it's good because of this, but I missed here and I missed there. And this would have been a little better like this. And, and to really be objective and like, and, 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 and logically look at stuff. It's generally like, this is mine and it's the best, you know? Yeah. And so that really, I think been something too, that is a big barrier for people to get past, um, to be able to look at stuff and go, well, fuck, maybe I need to, maybe I need to figure out, I need to ask people more questions. I need to be able to look at this and be able to, and be able to like tell the difference between what this one is and what that one is. And how do I make mine look like that one? Cause mine looks like this one. And that's like, you know, that's an important part of really doing any kind of process to really break it down. It's like you go to a restaurant and they're not really doing very good business. And you're like, dude, people want food, especially yeah. like here, you know, and I've seen like all these places like pizza places or whatever it is. And they're like, I don't know, you know, we make great pizza and nobody's buying it. And I'm like, guess what? People fucking buy great pizza. Like you don't have to twist people's arm to buy a fucking pizza. They want the pizza. They just don't want your pizza. And yeah. the only to make your pizza be the pizza people want is to like ask somebody like, dude, how do you, can I maybe like get the starter for the dough? And then like, how do you do your dough and what temperature is your oven and what is in your sauce? Can I get the recipe for your sauce? And you know, like those little things and what's, I made it like this, what happened, what went wrong? And then all of a sudden, like in this area and not so knows this, if you had good fucking pizza in where I live, you would stay in business for fucking ever, ever. and you would make it right. Oh yeah. But, there's been every pizza place has come and gone and some of them are good here and there. And like, it's like, okay, you go there and you go, Oh, this is great. And it's inconsistent. And this is just an, an, an analogy to, to what's up with weed too. You know, like you really have to fucking um, constantly try to figure out what it is. Now, if you were one of the people who just happened to fucking make some shit and it came out really good and everybody loves it, then fucking go with it. If the recipe works, it works. But if it's not working, you got to know when to look at it and be like, fuck, what, what do I need to do? You like, you, you have you ever watched like, what's that bar rescue or those oh, yeah, shows? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the Gordon yeah. Ramsay, he comes in, he's like, no, dude, we're going to make a fucking bruschetta and it's going to be bread and you're going to put tomatoes on it and balsamic vinegar and some fucking basil. You guys are making this fucking crazy concoction and nobody likes it. And yeah. you look at it fucking simple just stop doing all this weird shit and it's the same with with weed and the weed market you know it's just it's it's a weird it's a weird thing and then, and then there's so much that is done on that level and so little that's done on the really crazy level that you know it's it's like i'm convinced if you're really still on that level that people still want your weed but if you're just a little bit below it it's like what the fuck what, what are you gonna I mean, do yeah, and then <laughs> networking too is tough yeah there's there's an aspect where people kind of went from like trying to grow the best weed they possibly could uh which never happened exclusively there was plenty but you know there's a lot of people that like you know now they just try to grow like decent commercial you know they're trying to grow decent commercial at scale and like and the decent commercial is rough you know and so like the name strain game part of the reason why like you know, the purple craze happened. And then right after that, the Kush and the sour and, and, and cookie and all that. Um, part of the reason why that exploded so much in our area was because people wanted to just give the broker what they wanted. Like if the broker was like all 58 of these look good, I'll take them all, you know, and then they look at this other guy's stuff and he's got some nice stuff and they end up taking 10 when he leaves, the guy that had the variety looks at the dude that got cleared out and was like, can I get that from you? What is yeah. that? I want to get the thing that the dude is going to come and clear me out. Whatever that is, I want it. Yeah. You know, Homo. and I'll try to figure out a way to. That's the, that's the sourdough starter for your crust, you know? Yeah. That's give me like that one. Urkel. That's the fucking sauce right there, you know? And, and that's what's, what. What's funny talking. about Urkel is that there was a time in which there was an endless demand for indoor Urkel from our area, right? And basically like every big grower I knew ran indoors of Urkel. And then when the purple craze ended and it went on to sour and Kush and these other things, fast forward 10 years and there was like six dudes that held on to Urkel. When, 
we both knew dozens and dozens of people. Everyone had it. That was regs. That was what, if you had weed, like it's probably your goal. Yeah. Or a know. very type of weed, you know, there was blue dragon and purple Nepal and grape ape and it, it but it was like purple with the sweet fruit loopy, you know, it, that kind and it's of also that I should, we should mention too. It's also that kind of thing where like that craze was one of the first times where people wanted to give their own name to something, whether it was different or not, or whether it was just a slight variation or a bag seed of whatever there had to be GDP and, and grape ape and purple Urkel and purple dragon and, you know, and platinum purple. And, you know, and it was like this thing where it was like people, there was like the start of people wanting to differentiate their little thing. Didn't yeah, matter. Cause it was very say, different. Yeah. Cause the name had worked. You're like, well, fuck people, you say it's purple Urkel, like everybody, everybody wants it. You know, the names were really working and it was the same, like in LA, if you had some weed that was really good, you just call it such and such Kush. Or and then, to combine the two, yeah. when the purple craze ended, people were like, oh, people don't want this Blackberry anymore. I should call it Blackberry Kush. Yeah, because the Kush name was this South. Is the, this, is the, this is the purple Kush. This is the Blackberry Kush. It's just like yep. that Kush you want, but darker. Blackberry Kush yeah. was actually a strain, not so <laughs> huh? different than Blackberry. And they there, was, there was also a purple flow cut up here that finished in early September that was originally purple flow. And this stuff must have been, I don't know, like 5% THC or something. You couldn't get high off it. It smelled really nice and sweet. It smelled really similar to what the Blackberry clone was, mm -hmm. but it turned way darker. And it was done so early and fast, and it got tons of these huge buds everywhere. And everybody started calling that Blackberry Kush. And online, I've seen a lot of people call that one Blackberry. And I'm like, no, that was the Purple Flow. It was Purple Flow for like maybe a year or two. And then all of a sudden, everybody went, it kind of smells like that Blackberry clone. And the Blackberry wasn't very stony, but it wasn't as no stone as this fucking Flow clone. This Flow clone. <laughs> nothing it was like you could not high off the shit yeah. and uh and then after a while then that became the blackberry clone and i would ask people like so the one that didn't get you high at all this blackberry i'm like when did it finish because the other one was like a early october it was still very fast and it would want to auto flower but this one had thin leaves and it was very purple way more purple where the other one was very frosty and pretty almost like a bubba but with a little bigger features and it tasted really good it did get you that high but people didn't give a shit because you smoked something else to get stoned but it tasted so good and then the other one came in and it got really big for like two seasons here and everyone grew it and then all of a sudden everybody was like you know what i'm literally like not getting any fucking effects from this no. <laughs> And there's an aspect of that, he mentioned it before, but there's an aspect we should probably talk about when, when the name game happened. In the beginning of any of these name games that occur, if it has the name and it's, and it's similar or the right cut, it just all goes. Like if, you know, it just went, right? And then as more and more people get it, the quality has to be nicer. And so sometimes people would have a hard time getting like purples to turn purple in the middle of summer because their rooms would be too hot. And it wasn't like, you know, people didn't have great like environmental controls back then or something like that. And then you'd get some like green purple that was like harder to sell. And so like, that's kind of like what happens when like, when a market starts to get saturated with a particular strain is like the best versions of it still go, but it, it loses that like, if it's it, it goes. Cause like early on, if you had Kush or you had sour, or you had purple or whatever, and you had it, it went. And then as more and more people got it, quality became more important. And you actually had to have like really nice version of it for it to go as easily. Yeah. You know? Um, but you know, that's kind of like, that's, you know, there's an aspect to it where it's, you know, he's right in the sense where, you know, the name game happens and stuff gets, stuff gets all mixed up, but it really is like, you know, if you've been around for a long time, you can see a lot of similarities in today's weed mashed together. That's really old weed, you know, like we really actually haven't gone all that, that far away from things. I will agree with that. We've mashed it up in various different ways and we've added all kinds of different names, which just kind of obscures, but we really haven't, we really haven't like people think now 
weeds better than it's ever been. And that's kind of probably just patting yourself on the back. Yeah. You know, weed's been really good for a long time. It just mattered whether or not you had access to really good weed. More people have access now than before, but yeah. I don't know that weed's any better than it is before. You know, in fact, it might've been better 20 years ago on average, you know? On yeah. average, I would probably have to agree <laughs> with what we yep. have now, yeah. You know, and then there's another thing too when it comes to names and stuff like that, where it's like, obviously we're in like the, the marketing era where everything has to be candy or cake or, or desserts or sugar or like evoke some kind of image. Um, but you know, back then it was like, you know, he mentioned it before, but like you could get some weed that like gave you like brow sweat and you'd call it the sweat. I'm not even saying that's it, but that's like how a lot of names came about. Nobody would name yeah, anything. Nobody would name yeah. anything sweat today. Nobody would name anything dog shit. Nobody name would name anything. Like there's a million names that would, that would never work, you know? Um, I mean, the Mendo P that I found it, you know, I, I didn't know exactly what it was. So I just called it, it was purple from Mendo. So it became Mendo purple. And at one point I was talking to my buddy who showed me some weed that was really bomb. And it was like, it was kind of smelled to me like a mix between like what I call the Leggett perp smell and the, and like the, the purple Urkel smell in a sense. And my buddy was like, yeah, I got this from this guy on Bell Springs. He's, he's the guy who, because at one point people were saying, oh, Urkel is just a plant from the Mendo, from the Mendo perps. Right. And I'd never seen Mendo perps. And so uh, my buddy showed me the buds and I was like, damn, this is bomb. And it was some kind of bomb Afghani. It was super good shit. And this guy was like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the guy who um, that, that the Mendo perps came from. And what's funny is I don't even think the guy was lying. I think he heard about the Mendo perps that was yours that got popular and that people were rumoring Urkel came from. And his weed, he probably had called Mendo perps because it's a pretty vague fucking name, right? It's like sure, black yeah. Afghani. Very, or, very, very vague. Yeah. Yep. Whatever it would, or like Big Bud. Or, you know what I mean? Snow bud. Like, these things could easily be reused by somebody. Like, um, imagine now when you try to name strains and you Google it. People come up with the same fucking idea for oh, a yeah. lot of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's really it's hard. To... And I mean, even it was so even I... regional, right? Like, <laughs> like you just said snow bud. Like, if you got snow bud from Eugene, it was the Eugene snow. If you got it in Humboldt, yeah. it was the Humboldt snow. If you got it somewhere yep. else in Oregon, it was called Oregon snow. And the Humboldt guys yeah. and the Eugene guys and the Oregon guys all thought that theirs was the first one and everyone else got theirs later. Yeah. Because it's where they saw yeah. it first. Yeah. You know? And so I, I was talking to Caleb at one point and I told him about that guy and I asked him like about like the perps, what is it? And I was just curious because he, he seemed to have done a lot of work with all the different things. And he goes, dude, the Mendo perps is totally different than the Urkel. It's not even in the same ballpark. No. And there's no way that there's any truth to that. And I was like, oh, okay. And it's the same as like when one of the first times I really bullshitted with a mulatto to show, I was like, yeah, I go when I was in Maui in the late 90s or the early, right around 2000, somewhere in there, there was this weed that my buddy Lance used to always have that he called dog. And he was always like, this is the dog. And I was always like, damn, this is some fire fucking weed. And I wasn't really familiar with any of like the cam and the diesel and all that shit came later for me because I wasn't seeing a lot of clones. And I was seeing more, like I said, that lineup of the humble clones, those more like commercial ones that were around and shit. And so I remember talking to Caleb and being like, yeah, I don't know. Like I might have, cause this is after I had been reading shit online and stuff. I was like, I, it might be the it might be the um the original dog bud i'm not sure because these dudes were in oregon and they were in maui and they had it and then years later i was able to talk to my buddy gabe from over there and he goes no i know the dude who had that and he says that he found it in a bag of chem dog 91 yeah. 
and he found a seed and he popped it and they call that the dog in Maui. Yeah. And that was right around that time period. And I was like, all right, well, that makes sense. But the names are so trippy because them just going, oh, we got it out of chem dog. We're going to call it dog. Then you get that weed. And then you hear the stories and you're like, well, so is it that? And it's so easy to like think that that could be the real lineage and then be like, well, no, because this information disproves it. But that's why it's good to keep track of all of it to go, okay. And then it turns out, fuck that dog. That's really good fucking weed, right? It's a really good clone. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And then years like and years later, Caleb runs a bunch of, uh, you know, a couple rooms of Chem 91 S1s. And a bunch of them look like that Maui dog cut. Yeah, so of course. Because, it, yeah. you know, so it, it probably all, was. Like, you could put some pictures that he took right up against some really nice pictures of that Maui dog from 99 or 2000 or whatever, and they look almost identical. And so you could yeah. imagine it being bag seed coming out For of... Sure coming out of that weed you know yeah. and that's one of the things like that's one of the coolest things to me about s1s is when if you just if you do that you can if you do an s1 because i've gone up there and i've seen you know a uh, half a room of of urkel s1s and half a room of mendo p s1s and you can tell just by if you're a breeder at all that these things are not related like you don't see yeah. any similar expressions whatsoever right yeah and, and that's the same thing with this seed that was the, that he was calling Mendo perps and saying, Oh, I made the Mendo perps. I don't even think that he was, I mean, this shit was some nasty Mendo perps. It just was not Mendo perps. It wasn't the same thing to this day. I'm still like, fuck, I wish I could get some of those seeds because they were these buds that were like way chunkier than any of this other stuff. And a really cool, obviously Afghani, probably pure, really sweet, really nice, but probably totally unrelated to both strains. You know what I mean? Sure. But like not not without value, just because it has a funny name or a funny story, you're still like, fuck, I'm, I want to get my hands on that, on that stuff. And, you know, the, at this point, it's probably gone. Like he's probably from now, from, from a long time ago, he probably like ah, purple went out the door. That was in the purple craze. Yeah. And then – we probably started growing diesel and didn't even keep his seeds, you know, because I mean, so it, it's, I mean, the, the purple craze had what 15 or 18 year break between when it was hella popular before it got hella popular again. Right. Yeah. 15 years, yeah. something like that. It went, you know, Oh, Oh five, Oh six, everybody. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Cookies, cookies brought back purple weed in 2011. Teens. 2010. Yeah, so it, it really only took a little break, but as far as like Urkel type purple, even sweet purple like gelato, it took between Urkel and gelato to be back where people wanted sweet perps and not doughy perps or yeah, whatever. Not so, not so missed a big era where there were a few of us like me and Bodhi and a few of us that were only doing purples. So yeah, we didn't let it die, but it definitely died down. I just sure. mean in the sense, what I was more speaking of in terms of like, like, the market demanding it so much not yeah, that it, yeah, just no, went it went away down. but like there was an era yeah. when we were talking about like in the mid 2000s where like purple like purple weed was the thing and the everyone moment. wanted purple weed and like purple weed never went away but like i would yeah. say the last couple of years all of a sudden all my friends have been like well i guess purple weed is 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 in again people I, say I my weed is you know now i i haven't pitiful. heard i haven't heard oh, this is fire, but it's like not purple enough in a long time. But that's what yeah. you used to hear about that summer grown Urkel. You'd be Green like, grapes. oh, it's an Urk, but it like, it didn't, it didn't darken up on you, you know? Like it didn't get, cause it was hot in summer, you know? So it stayed kind of greenish and yep. they're like, oh, it's not quite purple enough. But darks, that's green grapes. We don't want that, yeah. No, it's the green and the, grape, the thing, no. Yeah, the purple craze too is interesting because it was the weed that made people want it initially. It wasn't so much that it was purple. Um, and it really popularized stuff being purple for a while. But it's trippy because, like, we in Mendo, there was always a lot of purple weed all the way back. Because the purple, in a lot of cases, comes out of these old Afghani types. Yeah. And so people had purple. It wasn't that it wasn't a thing. It was that there was no premium on it. People were like, some of them are green. 
Some of them are purple. Some of them are 50-50. And it didn't really matter at all. So some people had had like real varieties that were like, they're purple. Like this shit is purple. Uh, my buddy Jed and his and his dad, they had like this purple that was just straight solid purple. And it ran really late and it was really peppery and dank. Um, not so might know these guys. They're from between like here and, and Willits. But it was like the most purple um like it was so saturated you know but that's like also how like big blue was which i saw as early as the as the mid 90s you roll a joint you lick the paper and it bleeds through and the whole paper turns purple where you lick it and um and then even that way back before that like you asked me what's the first weed i can remember like 1989 was a common popular clone which when i say common and popular i'm from a small area yeah, yeah. with a group of people <laughs> so like, it, it's popular and common if it comes from leggett and willits yeah. it doesn't mean that there's two thousand it's not like now where it's like oh it's blue dream it's fucking all over the states or whatever it just means that like it made its rounds and it wasn't just one or two families that had it it was actually something that was like you know it, it got around and uh so as far back as the 80s, there was already a clone that was around and that people were really liking that was like, it was purple. And it was kind of more of a red or purple as opposed to a blue or purple. It was really fucking pretty. But um, and on top but yeah, of the weed just to that, say. On top of the weed that would turn purple just naturally, there was a lot of Afghan blended stuff in Mendo that would turn purple with the cold. Uh, if you let it go, yeah. if it got a light frost or something in October, especially if you took yeah. like all your people used to take their their first, what we call the first cut and they would take all the big tops first because you were scared of those rotting, you know, and you wanted to get some money in the barn. And then you would let your seconds, your second and third round sit. And a lot of times and you and you'd want those to ripen up a bit more. And so a lot of times those would go through some more cold nights. And those cold nights would bring out that like latent Afghan, um, you know, purpleness. So there was two things. There was like weed that just turned purple naturally in most conditions. And that was like, that was around. And then there was a lot of weed that if you grew it outdoor and you let it run late and it went through some cold weather, that it would turn purple. But it took some like in the 30s nights to make it pop. And so it's like being too like basically overdone and degraded and not really that good a weed at that point. Like a real purple, a real purple weed has to be like, you could like grow it indoor and it'll be purple or you can grow it outdoor and cut it before it turns to shit and it'll be purple. Like even Urkel outside didn't like to get um, purple as much indoor. It was easier to get it purple and outside it, for whatever reason, and I've seen this with a lot of things, like Hindu inside would get a little bit purple, but outside it would never get a touch of purple, right? And then the, um, it could, I don't know if it's like the, the spectrum or what, what it is, because I know it's not just cold because indoor you usually have it more controlled. But, um, but Urkel was one of those ones where it wasn't that great in the weather. It, it, was very kind of hairy on the inside and it would like to start to get a little bit of mold outdoor if you were not in the greatest area. And then you would have to cut your real big chunk. And then when you left, you would leave the small buds like he's saying, and then they would turn really dark and it would be like your little buds that weren't that great. Even yeah, if some of them exactly. were little this that weren't trimmed very well, but it would be really dark and people would be like, those are the ones we want that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, garbage. But people wanted color at that point, and that that. But that was like the first time when color mattered was with Urkel. Whereas before that, it was like, yeah, purple, you know, green is a bomb. And then Urkel made it like we want darks, and that was that was a weird time. Let's start moving it, in to to nowadays. What you're working with up in Mendo now, currently, Gene? Like what you're seeing around the scene nowadays. As far as breeding goes, what you're finding around nowadays that, that you're enjoying breeding with? Um, First thing that comes to there, mind. There, there's, some pe there's some people who have cool things that are from back in the era we're talking about where they, mm -hmm. they used to have um, cool stuff. And then you talk to them and they're like, they were actually like into plants and stuff. So they've kept things. 
And so there's like cool little things here and there that kind of pop out. Um, and I always try to like check them out just to see if, cause every once in a while, something's really, really dank. Yeah. Um, but like for the most part, I really try to focus on like digging through the stuff I have. Cause I know that I haven't done a good job of really, um, exploring all the stuff that I make. Cause I'll make a lot of stuff and then I'll, I'll pop whatever looks really the, the most attractive right away. Yeah, all, yeah. All, all breeders that do it for a while have a yeah. pile of and one so day. It, it does, but, but your instincts aren't always going to be correct. So like, I'm always sure. like, I try to avoid trying to pick up too much stuff here and there. So I am try to kind of like take what I consider to be my ones that are really like the backbone of what I've done and then do outcrosses with them here and there to make cool stuff, but then keep really trying to like focus on them. So those ones are like, like Pina, Grape Soda Skunk, the Jaro and Root Beer stuff, which are kind of almost the same. Um, the Lime stuff, which is really my favorite. And then I have like the various Kush lines that I do um, that are more like the OG type stuff. And then like the more little odd, like the Sky Cuddler Kush or Sky Cuddler Double Kush. And um, those ones are all ones that I try. I'm trying to like find what's really the best in them and take them those directions. And then, you know, I put out a little bit of them for other people to do the same thing when they're a little looser so that it's not all left up completely to me saying this is where it should go. Cause some people, they like, everybody likes something different. Somebody wants the sweet, somebody wants the straight OG one. And I'm like, ah, I like some influence from the OG, but OG is a thing. So I'm not really making anything if I make this OG. So I like have it where I did one, not so saw a little bit of the OG work that I was doing when he was up last time. It's like very, it's very kind of targeted there. And it's kind of reached that point where it's good. The high I like a little bit better um, than OG just, but some people maybe wouldn't because they want the more real intensity, but it's a little bit more clear, I'd say. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm always trying to like figure out really narrow it down but those ones that i named are like the ones that go back the most and that have been the most well received and that i've explored the most but what's fucked up is that like in those same years when i made all this different stuff there's all these other things that i didn't ever even try yeah and and for a long time and and not so knows how it is here like you could make a lot of seeds and if you weren't on the internet like who's ever going to want to grow all the seeds yeah so you're like thinking you're doing all this shit for nothing. And after a while, you kind of just feel like a geek, like doing weird shit for no, for like no end. Like what is ever going to, I, I can only get to some of them. Nobody wants to grow anything. I don't fucking know anybody. I only know these few people. So I have like these few friends, like my buddy's mom grows them for medical and kills it. And my one buddy couldn't get cloned. So he decided to do a big run and then he killed it. He wants more seeds. And, you know, like there's these little pockets here and there, but like I wasn't on the internet until 2012. Mm -hmm. So like I used forums, um, my buddy reservation labs who, who used to work with me up here, who's not from here, he was on the internet and I wish I would have known. He didn't ever talk to me about it. I remember it. him. And I, yeah. You knew about forums? Fuck. And like, he got all this shit from me, you know? Yeah. And so it was one of these funny things where I was like, I wish I would have fucking, I like, at, there was no, there was no reason for it to come up really. Yeah. Other than if you would have said, well, you should do, but you know, I was like, I was just like doing weed shit. He's like, what do you want to be on the internet for? Like, that'd be, he probably thought I'd think he was sketchy for being on the internet with weed, like probably say like, <laughs> and there, there's with my weed. where like you live up here. And I, I would say that probably like people have, uh, people have a lot of misconceptions about what it's like to actually live up here. You know, uh, our bubble is, is, is really weird in that regard and that you can be really insulated and like everyone, you know, my, everyone that you hang out with for the most part might grow weed, but that doesn't mean that like, you're tied into the larger community. Like I, you know, I, I kind of call it when I got on IG, you know, I did the forum thing a long time ago, but then I had a break and I kind of felt like I crawled out from under my rock. 
because we I was just living that like Mendo life, you know, or, I wasn't or came out of the closet. Came out yeah, of the closet. You know, so how, however you want to put it, however you want to put it, you know, but that, <laughs> you know, even with, with him with seeds, it's the same thing with me with, you know, people ask me about my collection of, of clones and I've tended to try to keep things that I like, but it's a total bitch because you know, he's talking about trying to get friends to, to grow his seeds me getting friends to back up my strains that aren't currently popular fuck it's so hard you know i mean even when times were easier four or five years ago people wanted to have a mothers of the things they were currently blooming for for flower they didn't want to back up a bunch of stuff you know and then it would get popular again and people would be like hey do you still have that man that thing that you had was super amazing could i get it and so i end up like having people back up stuff for me, but I try to like stuff it with people that actually love the two or three or four cuts that go their direction. Because I'm like, oh, if they yeah. love it, they'll hold on to it, you know? And I think there's an aspect now, and I don't exactly know how it's gonna change, but I would say like maybe five or six years ago before the, the maybe, when would you say, when would you say, Gene, the, the it started getting blown out bad about five years ago, huh? Before even the legalization started. There was like a year or two. But for seeds, at least, there was a thing where like Emerald Cup and the, some of these different things, as, as you guys both know, there was a bunch of growers with extra money in their pocket. They would come to these things and they would want to get some fresh seeds. And a lot of outdoor growers wanted to grow from seed because there was this idea that seeds got bigger than clones and so on and so forth, you know? and had more vigor or whatever. And so people were a little bit more willing to experiment. But now it almost like there needs to be like some kind of change in the regulations or laws because like the nurseries just want to grow what's popular. And then they want to sell popular clones to people that have, you know, the ability to grow flour. And those guys want to grow what's popular because they can't even sell direct to the public, nor can they sell direct to a dispensary. They have to convince a distro to buy it. And then that distro, you know, has to, um, you know, has to come back and, uh, and decide to sell that to like a, a shop where the days where, where, you know, Gene could have a friend go into a, into a shop in the Bay and say, I've got some, I've got a couple duffel bags of some fire weed. Are you interested? Those days are gone. Yeah. So, so even, even any breeder, whether it's, it's him or you or Caleb or anybody else, even just getting someone to be able to see it, someone to care about it, you know? Somebody could grow a bunch of his stuff and be like, oh my God, this shit's fire, you know, or, or whatever. And then the, the distro is like, I don't care. And then the public yeah. wouldn't even see it. And then, yeah, and then too, with, with like with seeds, growing from seeds, it's hard because, uh, you know, there's not really nobody really has any seeds that are so true breeding that you can grow them and then have it be like a true harvest batch where you can say okay, all of these are going to be 22 yeah thc sure. all of these are whatever you know whatever it is and like um like uh like the uh I haven't tested a ton of them, but like the grape soda skunks, the ones that we tested, they're like in the mid teens on CBD. The THC is almost not there. It's like turned into almost like a hemp line, but it's really fucking dank, you know, um, and is really close to being at that point. But even if even if you got it to be there, it's like he said, like the distro, why would the distro want that? They're like, no, we want something with whatever in the name. It has to sound like relevant with this little box that we know is definitely marketable you know so um you know it's one of those it's one of those weird things but just seeds in general because of that it's like okay they're all a little bit different you know um like i have a lot of things but they're always in the the low 20 percent thc or they're always in the mid 20 percent thc so it's like you can do them but it doesn't really like um it's still it's still hard to translate to the market if it's not and then that's why like over the last uh, however many years i mean i got my hands on cookies when it was like unknown basically you know and i i didn't even really i was like cool 
you know, this is what these dudes in San Francisco have and everybody really likes it in that circle and shit. And um, I started doing stuff with it because it, it there was neat shit. It reminded me of neat old stuff, you know? And um, so then like over the years, I've tried to do like, I did like the stuff with the gelato and all that just because you look at how it is and people are like, Oh, those were really cool. But do you have anything that's like the stuff that people are talking about? Do you have, you know, gelato 41, do you have blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I mean, you know, people, you want to give people the seeds that they're going to grow. And that's how it's turned into, um, uh, a, a, a weird thing where like, I'm like running parallels, you know, like I have like all the stuff that I really, really want to do. And some of that really actually is shit that has that stuff in it. I do have cookie and gelato work that I really, really like. Yeah. But at the same time, you're like, you have to have these things that people know, okay, I can get my new clone. That's a new flavor where when I go to do it, I can have something where people are going to go, okay, I can, this is something that is actually can go on the market and everything's been like put into such a small, sm such a small box now that you kind of have to go with the flow to an extent, you know, like you can't just, yeah, no, no, I'm just going to Acapulco gold. Everybody I'm like, no, they're not going to want it. Dude. They've been, you know? they've been know. talking about like doing some like, uh, making some laws or some amendments to what's going on where you could have some like farmers markets and you could do direct sales. Um, that's really what it would kind of take in order to get a bunch of variety out there is because, you know, I mean, you guys both know, like when you used to go to like a, um, you know, a high times cup or a, a emerald cup or something like that, it was kind of like a weed swap meet. You could crack yeah, open people's time. jars. There'd be some like furry dudes with from some place, some random spot up north, and they had a, a bunch of big jars this big of all kinds of weed. And you could crack and you could smell it and you could check it out. And so the way that they have it now, where it's like you can't see most weed in a store and you can't smell most weed in a store, they really like it. it they don't really have like a method for people to bring new things. You know, and like it, there has to be something more than just like a couple people being able to hype something, right? And and yeah. drive hype, you know, because there's a lot of good weed out there. He was talking about it a minute ago, but almost all my favorite weed, and what I mean by favorite weed in terms of like the weed that gets me the highest, it's almost all between 18 and 25 percent in THC. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's and not so most of this 30 percent club. I find to be very bland and boring weed. So there's something lost there when it gets above a certain quotient, you know, or people are breeding for numbers because people 20 years ago or longer, people bred by like, if you were breeding for high, a, the high is an invisible trait, right? It's invisible. Like you just don't know. So like a lot of times people, things would get famous because they worked. You know, not always like he was talking about the flow, like it barely it tasted great and it looked cool, but it barely got you high. But like a lot of weed got popular because it worked well, you know, and now it's kind of about the name and the look and the THC percentage and the numbers and not really much about like, how does it work? And so I think there's a lot of unique highs and a lot of different aspects, probably in various people's stuff. And you're like, well, how do I get it to the public? You know, how do I? You know, um, how do I get the how do I get the public to shine on me for a minute and want everything that I have? And so, you know, and then nurseries, nurseries just want to sell as many clones as they can to as many legal farms as they can. So they're picking the 10 or 15 most popular cuts that they think they can sell the most of. And that's what's on their menu this spring right now. You can go and you can look at all these nurseries and these nurseries have decided what do I think I can sell the most of this year? What do I think is a safe bet to mom up X number of moms of each one of these things that I can sell it on the legal market? And they probably, they probably have like a, a fuck ton of cool strains that they're not selling to people, but they have them, but they're just, yeah. they, they just don't, it's like, they don't think there's going to be an, it, I can't afford to have a hundred moms of that because I don't know if I'll be able to sell enough cuts. 
Yeah. And it's, uh, it's all unfortunate because it all makes sense because you go, well, what, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? Like whatever you're farming, if you're farming, if you're farming tomatoes and you know, people don't want, like this kind of tomato, then what, why the fuck are you going to farm that kind of tomato? And if you're the nursery selling plants to grow something, then why are you going to, if you know everybody's going to buy Granny Smith apples and you're fucking have a nursery that sells apple trees, like you're not just going to go, but I got a million of these and people are going to be like, cool, but like, where's those ones? And then you're like, well, but I, I, I have these. And then you're like, well, fucking, you know, it's like Joe Dirt's fucking snakes and sparklers, you know? You know, you got to have the shit that people, people want. Like it's, uh, it's just this loop that just gets, it just gets stuck in it. Um, I don't know. It's unfortunate, but it's like, it's just, I, I don't, it's how, it's how everything is, is laid out. And I think part of it has to do like with what you're saying, it would be nice if you could go, okay. Uh, like there's a system of, okay, everybody can get free samples. Everybody can look at a jar. Everybody can feel it. Everybody can roll it up and see what they like. But what happens is it's like somebody goes in, they go, I mean, it's in a bag. It's a sealed. I mean, what's the number? This one has the big number. I can't see anything else. And then now people too say like, Oh, look at the terpene test. Don't look at the THC test. And I'm like, well, high terpenes don't mean shit. Yeah. A bunch exactly. of terpenes don't mean something's flavorful. Skittles only has like 1.6% or some shit. Yeah. It's not even high. It just has tons of linalool, which is fucking amazing, you know? And then there's like all those things that are like that. And some of them that are high are really good, but it's not the, the numbers never tell you. And then even if you know that everybody else says it's really good, you might still smoke it and be like, eh. A, a lot of people could think that Blue Dream is the greatest weed ever because people love it so much. And a lot of people could think that Blue Dream is the worst weed ever because so many people hate it so much. But the only way to know if you really like Blue Dream or you hate it is to smoke it. And some people will be like, Fuck. it's like fucking cilantro, right? Or garlic. Some people are like, that tastes like shit. And some people are like, that tastes like heaven. And you've got to be able to... You take Blue Dream, and there's some stuff like Blue Dream or Green Crack or, you know, uh, or Berry White in our area that get, gets blown out and it gets a bad reputation. But if you grow like a four to six ounce plant or, you know, or a half pound plant of that thing and you keep it kind of small and you treat it right, it's delicious. It gets a bad rep because there's some dudes that are pumping out eight to 12 pound Blue Dreams that are kind of B grade. And they get treated yeah. B great. And then there's all this weed and it's like, oh, Blue Dream sucks. And it's like, yeah, that 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 version of it does suck. But if you took that strain yeah. and you grew six ounces of it in a 10 gallon pot, you know, in your side plot, it would come out fire and it would probably be a nice jar. I even grew, I grew Blue Dream and I didn't, I got it late, but it was still big, big ass plant. I mean, like, that's what was crazy about Blue Dream was like, I tossed in one out of like a, like a four gallon bucket like an actual bucket that my buddy gave me that was a spare plant and i put it in really late like as a replacement and i still think i got like five pounds of weed off of it and it's yeah. big huge but pretty big plant good size plant i mean you wouldn't have thought it had that much weed on it but dude it, the weed was all really fucking killer like i've always grown like i always had the 25 plants and i um I was able to always have like really big plants that were just the same fucking weed as I, as I had like anywhere else, but I didn't have fucking 350 of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just had like little gardens. So they're big plants, but very, you know, taken care of and, 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 you know, keeping track of what, um, I think a lot of people who had really big plants and who had a ton of them, it's like harvest is October 4th we're cutting this shit down or, yeah. you know, like these different, you get these like real vague growing styles. And for me, I'd be like, Oh, okay. Well, the North side of this plant is really fucking done. So I'm going to go ahead and cut like this section of this plant. And then it looks like the stuff that's on the very top is pretty close. And then I cut that and then it'd be like, Oh, the South side is not quite, you know, big plants are a whole trip because it's like a whole garden on one plant. So the south side finishes way later, like sometimes like, you know, 10 days later. 
two weeks later and the stuff on the backside is like done. And if you go through and you harvest your whole garden at once, you're like, okay, sweet. Well, now we have the backside is fucking, you know, 14 days too far. And the front side's premature and the middle's great, but fucking those tops probably should have come down. Cause they're kind of fucking fucked off up there now. And so people's stuff just winds up being like this, 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 this vague handling method that is not specific enough, you know, but, um, but like and there, it, it is, it is. Too. there's an aspect to him and I have talked about this years ago where like there are some strains that can maintain their quality as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, maintain their resin and things like that. But there is this ratio of like and in general, like the, there's a range where the plant's going to give you better weed if it's smaller. It's not in all cases, but in a lot of cases. And if you get it too big, it puts so much energy into like the stems and the structure and you're building scaffolding around it and it becomes a huge pain in the ass to maintain and the stem on the base is like this fucking big and you're worried about it cracking and you're like like gluing it when it splits because you're worried about rot and so there's just a lot of things that like make it like harder like he was just saying harder to like harvest it in the perfect window you're just yeah, trying to like a... ride this beast until it gets to somewhat done and you can start taking some of it down and you don't lose it to the million different things that can fuck with you, you know? And if you have 99 of those, that's really fucking hard to like really keep up with that. And if you just go ahead and take the same clone and do a big garden of seven gallon pots and your plants are just these little plants and that's like, oh, every bud is perfect and every plant is totally even and there is no front side, there is no back side. They're too small for that, you know? And you, yeah, like if you really want good weed, like it is a lot easier to do it in, in small pots. I was doing a big, size. big. Yeah, or even yeah, beds, the, but you can do it in beds, yep. but just moderate sized plants, you know? I mean, we yeah. grew giants in Mendo um, because, you know, there used to be, you know, plant counts were pretty intense. And if you got over 100, plant, 100 plants, the feds could get you, you know. Um, and then, you know, Mendo was like, okay, you know, like, we'll, we'll give you 25. 25, we won't really fuck with you too much. You know, you can have your 25 and you're safe. And then so people are like, well, how do I get 250 pounds off 25 plants? How do I get 200 pounds off 20 plants? You know, whatever it might be. And so you start developing these methods based on like the rules. Blue know? dream. Blue dream, you know, <laughs> blue dream. And, you know, oh, I'm going to grow green crack. And that's kind of where green crack or blue dream or berry white get bad names because people are like, oh, I can get this clone that'll give me this much weed on a reliable basis. And I can put 25 of them in my garden and that's my season. Right. And now there's too much B grade blue dream and people are like blue dream sucks. They're like, no, yeah. there's just a lot of commercial B grade blue dream on the market. It doesn't Some suck. People hate I, I have friends who like really love certain types of weed and like you can give them the best blue dream ever. They can grow it themselves or whatever. And that terp profile, they just Still fucking don't. hate it. Some people hate terpenaline. terpenaline Some people jack. hate things. Some people hate cookie terps. Some people hate perp sweet terps some people don't like chem d terps some people don't like gmo terps like some some shit's different like nobody likes the same things everybody doesn't like blue cheese and everybody doesn't like vinaigrette like some people are like no dude like some people ranch on everything and some people think ranch is fucking disgusting you know so like when you have weed there's these profiles of these smells and stuff where it's like you know some people love to wear really heavy cologne they think they smell great when they come in a room and me, when someone walks in a room with whatever heavy cologne it is, it's probably 99% of the time I'm going to be like, Oh, come on, dude. Same Why are you here. wearing something? <laughs> it's like, damn, that smells so good. You know, it's just, there's a lot of it. A lot of it comes down to, to, to preference, you know, like some what? people don't like really powerful weed. Some people like really mellow weed, even if they've smoked a shit ton of weed, you know, like. One thing all, we can all agree on. Now? Huh? is that everyone loves root beer. And while there's 331 fucking people in here right now, Gene, let everybody know where they can get your seeds. Um, so there's a little bit of stuff. I have the, um, the, uh, I have a little bit of stuff at alpineseedgroup.com. Um, uh, speakeasy, speakeasy.com has some stuff sometimes. Uh, LLF, 
has some stuff sometimes. Um, and that's basically the only people who I know who have anything really um, here and there. But um, what are you working on right now? What are you stoked about? Like right this second that you have in your shit and you're like, fuck, I can't wait for people to see this. Well, maybe, maybe we should Same. ask him this. It's spring. What have you planted, bro? Because I right see you post got... with green, like little greenhouses full of seed starts. So you're obviously excited about some things because you're planting. It's that time, right? You're popping seeds. All right. So this is going to be, this has got, this has got to be my last thing that I talk about. Cause I, I thought I figured the live was going to, I figured lives are about an hour, but we've managed to push into yeah. the hour. <laughs> yeah. So right. Like this is a, it's, it's a disaster in there and I'm in trouble, but, uh, um, Basically, uh, I have right now going a bunch of things that are like promising that either I have like people are testing out for me and I want to like get a get a hands on idea of like, OK, how do they smoke so that I can line up what their feedback is with what I really think. Yeah. Um, or there are things that I think might be super intersex prone and I just want to see a little bit of them to see like, are, are these things, is it just, are they, is it intersex everywhere in there? Um, so that we don't even plant more of them. So if I think that they might be real problematic or I already know that they're the shit, but I want to have an idea of what a few of them look like. I have like 18 little starts going of those types, right? Which mm -hmm. isn't very many, but it's enough to it's either or to confirm what's already been done with other numbers elsewhere, or even yeah. maybe that I have seen a little bit of stuff. And then the other ones, I have a tray of 36 each so that I can really see what does, you know, what does it look like when you have basically three packs worth of seeds? And then if it's a home run on that, and I'm like, holy shit, every plant is great in this. Mm -hmm. I can figure that statistically we're looking at something that's pretty good. Yeah. And if I look through those and there's nothing good. In, if there's not anything good in three packs of seeds, then I'm like, I have other shit that I can focus on. So it's basically right now a big test run where I have about 50 things going. Mm -hmm. I have Sensi star cross Sensi star cross Jaro. I have um, a bunch of cookie lines, Animal West F4s, which are gorgeous. They're like little dinosaurs, little rhinoceros-looking plants. Um, I have some of my OG lines, like not so, not so Saw, kind of the same stuff, but trying some of them more myself. Um, I have a bunch of lime crosses I made with the F5 lime males, a pair of males that I really liked out of a bunch of plants. Um I have Cherry West Cross Lime, two different lines of that. I have, uh, what else do I have? So there's like Chem D Lime, a um, few other cool things that I got, uh, like some cool cuts that I got from Skunk Tech that are bomb that I hit with that lime. I have, what else do I have? Um try and place exactly as I, if I kind of go walk myself down the rows. It's like Sensi Star, Fat Cross. I'm, I'm being paged. Um, <laughs> it's all good. And, uh, going down the line, yeah, all the cookie stuff, the Cherry Wests. I know there's other stuff that I'm not saying. There's some different Kush Crosses, um, like Yeska, OG, OG Jaro, um pk cross sky cuddler double kush um i don't know a whole bunch of different stuff but they're all that kind of stuff i'll do a post in a while that has like stuff up and uh and maybe a list of what all those different things are but anyway it's like 1250 plants basically nice. 50 to 18 of some 36 of the other um and and uh you know, like I said, that was my logic was like, all right, there's some that if I think maybe they're really problematic, like animal cookies back cross two, sure. try 18 or they all harm. If they're not all harm, I'm like, fuck, all right, we'll try, try, try 36 of those yeah. and see what's in those, you know, or try 50 of those. And then like some pure limes, uh, lime one cross lime F5. So lime one bread to F5 put back on the original there. 
Um, so I have like a targeted ma- mother, a uh, targeted males that are put back on the more open mother. So yeah. that that's a combination where this is already a predictable mom, but now I have a real predictable male set that I put back on them. Um, and then, you know, uh, line one back cross two and shit like that. Just a bunch of different stuff to look through and, um, and, uh, you know, pink champagne root beer and, uh, pink champagne lime, pink champagne pina. Um, and the pink champagne's not like the original. It's a bag seed clone that I got from these dudes and it's super killer. Really, really nice plant. But that's what's going down. I got to go uh, burn some beef. And um, thanks for having me on. Yep. And, thanks uh, for coming on, Jim. Thank you. Good night. Have a good Let's see. He's out. So All it's right. just us. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, I, I hope everybody liked that. We're going to try to uh, we're gonna try to bring on um, a series of friends uh, over the next couple of months here and there. Um, and do this a little bit more often. Um, and, you know, not only that, but it's like we tried to get a little bit of the infomercial about what he's got going on. Uh, but a lot of podcasts and stuff are kind of all about that. And we're trying to get a little bit more like history and, and, and you know, it's just asking different questions and people ask. So we didn't do a lot of like uh, reading comments or anything like that. I tried to ignore them for the most part. So I apologize. I saw people ask a bunch of stuff and it just didn't, didn't really vibe with the kind of the way we were flowing with the convo to answer most of it, you know, but um, anyway, I mean, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to bring this kind of stuff back. Um, you know, he, Before uh, everyone's gone, be sure to check out speakeasy seed bank. Uh, they've got some of our gear and jeans gear. Um, check out breeder syndicate.com. We have our Patreon up where you can come interact with us all the time. We shoot the shit all the time. We've got some fights going tomorrow. Um, check out the Northern Lights drop with me, and you can get it from me, or you can get them from um, Inspecta over at CSI or HumboldtCSI.com. Um, the NL5 drops out and slamming, fucking slamming. So that's up. Go get them. Um, there's breeders packs available, and what else we got? We will have Caleb on uh, talking about the NL stuff very soon. I talked we about will. last night. So yeah, we will have so. him, and we'll have we'll have some perps talk and stuff like that. And it's actually interesting. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to bring it up when uh, when Gene was chatting, but uh, Caleb uh, CSI also has some stories of his dad getting early NL, uh, like Gene's mom got. You know, yeah, and so. Um, you know, NL definitely was one of those things that kind of hit our region right around that late 80s time. Um, and so there's some stories and some stuff floating around of probably like the very early NL from Europe days. Yeah, which is pretty cool. That'd be really cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone for coming to showing up. This will be available as a podcast shortly. Um, so yeah, if you if you if it's not up for you to watch on Instagram, we take them down, we put them up for Patreon first, and then as a podcast. So hopefully if you, if you only caught some of it, you can go back, listen to it as a podcast soon. And we're going to try to, we're going to, one, one more thing. We're going to try to do this every Friday night around seven. We're going to yeah. try to get a little bit better about getting early warning about what we have planned for the week. Uh, we've yeah. kind of been doing it a day or two before. We're going to try to get a little <laughs> bit more organized and let people can. know, yeah. let people know what to expect, you know? So thank you all for giving us your Friday night and listening for long. And uh, we'll see you soon. Peace. Peace.